Yeah. Let me ask it slightly different then. Um, at what point did you feel there was a book involved in describing a left brain and a right brain? Um, a, a book that I read, something that gave me some insight or my interest in writing a book. What sparked off the idea that there is something biologically wrong with us? Um, well, really, I, I did become interested in the classic mystery of the human condition, why, why we are the way we are, particularly the more extreme traits we have, um, whether it be warfare or our obsession with destroying the place we live and harming each other, all these kind of classic um, symptoms, uh, you know, behavioural symptoms. And um, I, had a, I had a little bit of a background in basic science, nothing too, uh, nothing too deep, but just enough understanding of classic Darwinian theory, which, um, you know, I think is a fairly good way of explaining some of, some of the emergence of species and traits and so on. Um, so I, I sort of was interested in trying to figure out if there were clues in what might be the orthodox perspective in our evolutionary past, in our origins, that might explain how we got to where we are. Um, particularly as there were all these traditions which may be a lot less scientific, but they all seem to be speaking with a similar voice. It's something, something went awry, something, something went wrong in very simple language. We, we were very different at one point and slowly changed. And those traditions, those myths, if you like, uh, or, or, or even some of the oral traditions, even some of the written traditions, they weren't talking about it in a very positive way. It, it was framed as a degeneration, a, a regression to a more primitive state. So I guess like many people, you know, um, trying to figure out what had been going on. And I, I was just sort of juggling the clues that I thought might be rele re relevant to the question. So it was basic engineering, sort of developmental environment, construction materials, neurochemistry, our origins, what might have changed, and the basic mechanisms of consciousness, how we perceive ourselves and how some people perceive themselves differently, some people very differently. So was there any common factor in all of this and, and, and other areas as well? So really I was just looking, looking for a, an underlying cause maybe that, that maybe we'd missed. Um, just asking that simple question. The cause that you found <clears throat> was quite unique to me when I read your book which is that it's diet-based. When did you come to perhaps think about it's perhaps just di dietary? Uh, how was you convinced by it and how did you go looking for evidence that it might be diet-based? Um, well, I, I think there were several things running simultaneously. Um, the way I was working at the time, I was kind of juggling lots of bits of information and lots of ideas and again, trying to marry up what I normally distinct disciplines or distinct fields of thought. I was trying to sort of look at it holistically and see how they all interact. And at, at some point I was coming more and more to the conclusion that the classic interest in left and right brain was relevant, much more so than perhaps we'd recognised. Um, and in turn trying to explain why that might be the case, that, that took me more into the developmental environment through, through our our individual lifetime but also as a species uh, stretching way back and that's where it comes into what we currently call diet or I, I try and reframe I try to get away from diet just because there's so much baggage around it we, as soon as you start talking about diet people think oh well that's just a dietary thing so I was really interested in the molecular biology how you design construct and fuel the most complex molecular piece of equipment we know so so yes it was about diet but I was trying to look at it trying to reframe the way we look at it and um, that brought me straight into our origins and the very different ecology we evolved in biochemically much much different to what is considered normal now and how that must have impacted on what is a very chemically sensitive piece of equipment uh, we, we, we know you know the data is very good that if you change if you change the structure of a neural system even a little bit or change the neurochemical fuel even a little bit has a massive impact on our perception, our behaviour, our cognition. So really just looking at what might have changed, how that might have impacted and how that in turn may have manifested what's currently considered normal, the sort of the idea that we have 
split brain function and currently that's generally seen as adaptive and maybe a good thing. I just wanted to ask a different question. Well, maybe is it a good thing or has something gone amiss here? Mm. Okay. <clears throat> the, the period that you speak about in your book is that perhaps we had a one voice, uh, not a two voice brained. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about this one voice? Uh, perhaps at that time the division didn't occur. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? I'll try to. Again, it weaves two or three things together. Um, and again, it, it sort of would partly come under the term of reverse engineering or how, trying to speculate um, how our neural system might have developed differently if you start putting in some of the factors that are well evidenced. So a different biochemical regime, again, going back to the forest and how... Okay, let me stop you there. Um, let me go back a little bit further then. At that point, we did not have a division of left and right brain. What would life be in a like for that creature? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I think the simple answer is very different to what it is now. Um, and I suspect it, the, the nearest we currently get are, are, well, two things really. One, the experiences people still currently have through uh, spontaneous experiences or experiences induced by specific techniques that have come down through many traditions, so say from meditation or kind of vision quest shamanistic approaches or the judicious use of neurochemical chemistry and so on. The, the, all, the, all these let's, things can let's take imagine, us to Let's imagine this, this, this person, wherever he is, uh, he or she, does not have a distinctive left brain, right brain, function. Mm. What would life be like for that creature? Um, Do you need me to elaborate on that? No, I, I'm, I'm just more? trying to frame it because I'm stuck using very left brain terminology to try and explain a different experience which is always quite tricky. Um, okay, let me make it a little <clears throat> bit more specific. What would life be like without that constant chatter in our brain? Is what I understand left brain function being that it's constantly chatting away, usually nonsense, uh, bombarded with fears, sure. yeah. bombarded <clears throat> with notions, ideologies, so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, what would life be like with that part of the brain, that part of the noise switched off? Well, switched off or the part of the brain that currently does all the chattering and is frightened and hangs on tight and dominates our perception would have been functioning very differently rather than being switched off. Can you so, elaborate much, much more on what that might have been like? Because you call that in your book the golden age. Sure. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's a really good question and I, I am going to struggle to find a very precise way of describing it. Um, I think free from fear, free from the chattering, uh, a state of being that we would currently have to use superlatives to describe, but that would be normal. It wouldn't necessarily. What is this word that you just mentioned? Uh, like the superlative range of experiences. So what we what we currently describe as a profound experience, an intense, joyful experience, uh, a sense of deep empathy and compassion. All those traits would be normal, everyday things. They'd be very powerful. Um, but they wouldn't, I guess, they wouldn't be perceived as particularly powerful. They would just be the way things were and the way we'd relate to each other, to our environment would also be very different. There'd be much, much less a sense of individual identity and concept. So we, we currently describe ourselves with concepts, um, Mark, Tony, human beings, uh, beings of light, whatever, there's still concepts, the experience would would be, the, would be the dominant thing, and it, and it would feel... I, I suspect we'd have to use words like pretty damned amazing, pretty damned wonderful. Of course, they're just words. So, at that period in time, we would have felt emotions much more intensely. Is that what you're saying? <clears throat> would we be been able to feel pleasures intensely as well? Our sense of uh, being together as a family, perhaps as a unit, uh, say on a social level, would be much more intense? Yes, uh, again, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to have to draw on bits of examples here and there, but I, I think where people have come into 
what we currently call altered states, I mean, I'm going to turn this back to front and say this is the altered state. Our current state's a deeply altered state, very degenerate state, and then that's our reference point. So we describe altered states back to front almost. But the kind of altered states people experience, whether it's through relationship, a deep loving experience, or where people have come together in maybe some kind of group technique, or it could be things like the judicious and careful use of uh, things like MDMA and dance, where that's worked really well. Obviously, there are casualties. Let me, let me stop you for a minute, Tony. Uh, the, the, my question <clears throat> is, what would, would life be like on a left brain, sorry, on a right brain level? What would, can you elaborate using your own uh, experiences? Like, for instance, when your son uh, was born, I think you mentioned your daughter on the phone mm. as well. Mm. Uh, I would say that these are very much right brain uh, functions, you know, a, a great level of yeah. uh, emotional, tense feeling, uh, forgetting one's name, you know, the only, not very many things doesn't matter, only what you're looking at, which is your baby. So you have yeah. many of those kind of experiences, and, I'm, and I'm, what I'm trying to do is look at this creature in nature mm. that is experiencing these things as you describe them as a right brain functioned creature? I think it, it, we'd be free from that incredibly mm, multi-layered conceptual world we all inhabit. It would be experiential and again that's a word so again we're using words to describe what is a different experience which is quite tri tricky but it, it would, I think it would involve again a lot of profound this and profound that relative to our current state so a profound sense of connectedness as I said a profound sense of joy a profound sense of wonder just at our very existence I mean it's you know we're, we're stuck in a state of mind now where we're always looking for stimulation yet we're hurtling along on a speck of dust in the middle of nowhere and, it, and it's mm -hmm. profoundly amazing and, and that passes us by now well I think we would have we would have been in a profound sense of reverence at our very existence I mean again I'm you know, it, Would this it, it, creature, for instance, be self-destructive? Not, not remotely, in my opinion. No, it, it would have been an abhorrent. It, it wouldn't even have been a concept. It wouldn't even have been a choice. It would have been almost impossible. I think it, the, the, our, our brains, our neural structure, would have been such that to be destructive would just be out with any. Would be out with our reality. It would be an alien alien experience, alien concept. It would be trying to take somebody in the most heightened state that we ever hear about these days and expecting them to behave violently. Well, it goes totally the opposite way. Again, it's, it's mm -hmm. this sense of connection, empathy, joy, wonder. Quite fluffy terms in many ways, but very powerful and not weak in any way. Very, a very strong sense of connection, a very strong mm -hmm. sense of perpetual realization that we are something, something very different to what we think we are now. Okay. While, while I'm listening to you, um, I'm thinking to myself, you're really kind of struggling with what a right brain function would be. Mm. Uh, in that sense, I suppose it is very, very uh, dominant. It's very hard to find examples of right brain function. If you could find a right brain function example for me, uh, just two, that'd be really good. That everybody well, else here can share your well, well again, I, I, I think I think this is this is th hinted at through all the traditions. Trying to describe something you have to experience is very tricky. You can only suggest that the experience would be different, and then point to some limited examples. So, if you've experienced a profound sense of wonder, and when you hear certain kinds of music, for example, that might be quite a common thing. Or, or, or if you meet somebody you feel an immense and immediate attraction with and all that wonderful secondary traits that come in that we classically call it a sort of falling in love, those kind of feelings. Or, you know, when your child's born and you have that profound, you know, you, you're just taken out of yourself. Anything like that, I think those are the glimpses. I think they're only glimpses of the state we'd be in all the time. Um, but it, again, it's a, I'm trying to emphasize I don't think there's a concept that can really do that justice because however good the concept is, it's just a concept. It's just the words explaining it. It's an experiential thing. But of course, most people have had glimpses of something at least. Some people have had more glimpses, some people have had less. 
and those would be kind of some of the examples um, but it does vary with the individual just just the best experiences you've ever had particularly when they're very joyful and incredibly relaxed and you feel like you're a different person or a different being mm. um, I think those are the the clues the experiential clues that take us a little bit away from where we normally live trying to describe things and you begin to feel things and they feel pretty amazing usually mm. and then something went wrong and this is where your book really touches upon a few things which is dietary yes um, I, I guess something went wrong is, is one way to describe it I don't want to sound like it's all gloom and doom because I'm, I'm trying to present this as a diagnosis that, that might offer a way to restore mm. things and you, you call it the fall of man that is doom and gloom, so help yourself, it's, it's a chapter well, out yes, of your own book. Yes, I, 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 think, uh, I think the evidence is pretty supportive of that when you look at what we're doing to ourselves and where we live, so I, I don't think doom and gloom Th this is This of over. course is all aftermath, yeah. we're talking about the point of the fall of man. Sure, well, well I, I, I think winding the clock back to, to roughly 200, 250,000 years ago, give or take, and I'm not attached to those dates, so I, I think this is where there was this symbiotic association in the tropical forest and our neural system can you elaborate on the word symbiotic symbiotic mm -hmm. um, yeah it's it's a way of describing um, where I mean I'll, I'll step back a little bit we currently science teaches us and most of us have become accustomed to the idea just of, give of, a, of a quick seeing, definition yeah, seeing things individually we have individual things we have individual species, we have individual plants, they've all got names. Of course that's all arbitrary, the language is all arbitrary. And it's really coming back to the genuine and very real interconnectedness of everything. It's all interdependent, there's no such thing as a tree in the forest because without all the other trees and the soil and the organisms and the fungi and so on, none of it would exist. So it's really getting back to that kind of gay and idea, the sort of singular organism. Taking that a step further, some relationships are very, very entangled there where what we currently describe as separate species or organisms, they form such tight relationships, they become effectively the same organism and symbiosis, symbiotic organisms are one way of describing that. Um, I, th I think a classic example might be lichen, the kind of lichens you see in the forest where it's a fungi and an algae and they they form a union and they become effectively a distinct organism, totally inter interdependent on each other. And that's, that's where the evidence from modern science supports the idea that the primate lineage, the apes, our, our ancestors, by degrees formed relationships in the tropical forest with the plant's sex organs, actually, the plant's fruit. The, the fruit only emerged in response to this relationship. So, very, very complex relationship began developing that had a massive impact on the development of our brain. This is what I'm proposing. Again, the data is very good. Um, it became so entangled that forget about the primates, forget about the forest. You're talking about a singular organism. And the traits that emerged out of that relationship are physiology and particularly the expansion of our neural system, the rapid expansion and its unique architecture and our late development, the sort of late juvenile, you know, the long juvenile phase that allowed a neural system to grow. These were all entirely dependent on this relationship being maintained. Um, uh, the unique factors, the unique biochemistry weren't coming from our own DNA, our own genome. We, mammals generally don't produce very complex biochemistry. They produce limited biochemistry that builds a really good survival system. It's a, it's a fantastic neural system, it's really good at fighting, at competing, at surviving, at reproducing. You start plugging that basic mammalian model into the tropical forest, particularly this unique association where, again, I'm, you know, we talked about diet before, I'm trying to reframe when, what we think about diet and food. I'm talking about fruit. Well, fruit isn't just another food. It's the plant's sex organ. It's a in simple language, it's a swollen ovary. And you form a relationship with the developmental environment, a bit like the mammalian uterus. If you form a relationship with that over millions of years and you're flooding your system with the hormones and the biochemistry designed to read DNA, that's what developmental environments do, loaded in biochemistry to build a new generation, all right, it's a plant. But again, I'll throw this in. Uh, the modern reductionist way of describing plants and animals is very arbitrary. You know, we forget, oh, plants are so different. Well, actually, it's all biology, another arbitrary term. 
the biochemistry is very similar actually the differences between plant and animals you can number in the fives or tens or a few dozen the similarities are enormous you plug these two things together and you get a different organism emerging and I think the really interesting piece of the jigsaw is, is the the later layers of, of our brain, the neocortex, that expanded very rapidly. I'm suggesting this was a direct product of this association and utterly dependent on this association. And all the really cool stuff, all the really interesting traits that I'm alluding to, required that association to be maintained. Okay. The foods that we were eating is what created that relationship with nature. And the foods we eat, that we were eating at that particular period was directly involved in creating the brain functions, the sensations, the rapid development um, in brain growth. Yeah, they, they were part of the design, very, very fundamental to the, to the design of a very unique neural system, almost non-existent in the whole of the fossil record or anywhere you look today. Big, complex neural systems, you can't find them anywhere except the tropical forests so there's something going on there with the possible exception of some of the dolphins and so on mm. nowhere else do you find that mm. yet okay. people are obsessed with looking everywhere but the tropical forests, and it's like they grow on trees you know it's mm. a bit of a pun but there they are well you've definitely answered the question which my original question was what was the golden age like so you've answered that so let me ask the question again which is the other bit of your uh, book the fall of mankind what went wrong? What took them away from <coughs> eating these plants? What took them away from having this wonderful relationship uh, with nature, this highly developed sense of perception? And from what I understand of the subconscious mind or the right-hand brain, it can see incredible distances, it can hear incredible distances, it can probably hear predators coming at it a kilometre away, and. I'm thinking to myself, it had all this comfort, all these super senses built in, mm. and then something went wrong. Yes, well, a a again, reiterating that all those traits, uh, the structure that was supporting them, uh, and I want to emphasize, I'm not saying a neural system is who we are, but it acts as some kind of instrument or lens or, or yeah. almost like so a telescope. We're, we're at the post period now, so yeah, we're at the, post period, it, it's, yeah. the, the fall of man is about to occur. Okay, well, so well, something something happened to create that. What what the, might that this be? Am, this amazing piece of equipment was entirely dependent on this relationship, and it, at that at that time, the the classic left right specialization, as it's currently seen, or asymmetry or differences, didn't exist. They'd been ironed out by the flood of hormones from the plants, and that obviously there's a bit of complexity there. I won't go into that now. So we, we had a very uniform neocortex. It was, it was a singular system with phenomenal traits, the mm -hmm. kind of things that crop up in Savant syndrome and all the prodigious uh, traits that humans occasionally, occasionally mm -hmm. glimpse. They were the normal function. The Achilles heel in all of this um, is if your consciousness system, your sense of self is entirely dependent on a sustained flood of very complex, very unique biochemistry, the Achilles heel becomes the tropical forest. If there's any separation there, you're going to be in trouble. And tropical forests, as most people know, they're very stable, even over evolutionary time scales, particularly the, the non-seasonal tropical forests, parts of the equatorial forest. Um, they, they, can, they can be stable for millions of years, but occasionally, with very big climatic changes, big drying out, they can shrink, almost disappear. And it looks, like, um, it looks like the African forests in particular were susceptible to big climatic change, particularly big drying. And if the forest shrinks enough, if it, if it shrinks back to the rivers and, and there's not enough to sustain populations, you end up, you end up with, with this symbiotic relationship beginning to break down. What we currently call individual animals or species or groups becoming isolated, the forest just disappears. Mm -hmm. Some, some, will, some will break out of this relationship earlier and of course we survived or our ancestors survived or their relatives survived but the formula absolutely essential to maintain this amazing consciousness system was gone mm. and, and I think what so began... So they, to, were, one, they one, were driven out of the forest because... Or, or, the, or the forest disappeared, or the, forest the forest left them. Yeah, I, I mean it doesn't preclude individuals or groups 
wandering out of the forest for, for whatever reason, um, and that's where you tend to get the fossil evidence. You, you get very little fossil evidence in the wet forest, so we don't really know what was going on in there. Just the biochemistry fits very well and our physiology fits very well. But once you get this separation, um, part of, part of the, what, what you're alluding to is, is, is the fall of humanity, which is hinted at in all these traditions, is partly the loss of this complex chemistry that, was, that changed everything in our developmental environment. And we began to be exposed to our own mammalian hormone regime in particular, the, the steroids like estrogens and testosterone, which in all mammals play a massively important part in the development of our brain. But they build a very, a very basic brain and they build it very quickly and it's great at survival. So we're losing all this modification of, of that developmental window and slowly being exposed actually to our own hormones, so ironically enough. So we've got enough, a, a new evolution now, a new evolution just as that relationship with the fruits and the flowers and the vegetables created that uh, mm. sim uh, semi-symbiotic relationship, uh, I would say now we got a, a new evolution. This is the human being just simply adapting, that, that, that's, what, that's one way to look at it, um, and, and I accept that's one way to look at it. I, I'm going to suggest you can look at it a different way, and rather than adaptation, it's, it is a premature birth, it's a separation in, in the same way that if you pull two symbiotic organisms apart, one or the other are going to regress, even fail completely because they're so codependent. And rather than a, a different phase of evolution, I'm going to say it's a reversion, a regression to a more primitive type. So you, you separate this very complex organism and our blueprint, our GNA, what it, what it's, what it will always build in a, in a sort of autonomous way is a basic mammalian system, which is quite a primitive brain, quite a, mm. quite a sort of emotive way of describing it. And where it gets fascinating, I think, is, is one side of a brain, uh, the evidence is quite good for this, is genetically distinct from the other. They're slightly different. Archaically, there, there, there almost certainly was specialization. So as, as I was saying, that the plant biochemistry kind of ironed this out without changing the DNA, just ironed it out because hormones can do that. They can, you know, it's, if you take enough estrogen as an adult male, you can start developing female traits. Your DNA is not different the hormones will read the DNA differently, that's all, and change the structure. Mm. So I'm saying that happened in one direction and ironed out this specialization and allowed this unique proliferation, a very unique sort of consciousness system to emerge. Well, when that separation occurred, there was this reversal almost, this reversion, and one side, it could have been either side, but one side was more sensitive to our own hormones than the other, and it's been reverting back to its archaic or primitive type much more quickly. Mm. Now, and that, that's the split. That's where you go from, you were talking about the one voice. And the traditions echo this very well. Uh, I'd say they actually diagnose our condition very well. If we can understand the language, they talk about a split. They talk about a separation. They talk about a, a very different self, a split, the emergence of something new, something more akin to what we call our human self now, and slowly but surely it began to take control and eventually took complete control relatively recently, five to ten thousand years ago. I, when I talk about evolution or understand evolution, um, I don't assume that every organism is reaching for a higher plane of existence or mm. greater levels of complexity. I also understand evolution as being uh, a survival mechanism <clears throat> or yep. an adaptive mechanism. Mm -hmm. So when something does uh, retrogress or regress, it's still surviving, it's still flourishing as it mm -hmm. were. So it, in that sense, I understand what you're saying, that the, the creature reverted back to something that it may have... Is reverting, I would put it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So as part of evolution? You, you can take that view, and I don't think there's anything incorrect in that. And it's, it's, a, it's an emotive area with hardcore academics that that talking about um, evolution in a particular direction. It's, it, it's almost a, it, it, it's often seen as just a survival process, and, and that's fair enough. Um, some other people take a, a broader view and say, well, is there something more going on? But just looking at it as a purely an adaptive process, uh, primitive, well basic neural systems are incredibly successful. 
no doubt about it. We're, we're surrounded by them. The fossil record suggests they're incredibly successful. So this isn't about survival. If we're judging it on purely survival basis, we could regard ourselves as incredibly successful, incredibly dominant. But is that the only way to judge our experience? Um, I'm interested in, in the idea that something unique emerged that went beyond basic survival. Um, perhaps in an environment, the only environment it could have happened, uh, the deep tropical forest doesn't have many predators. It's a relatively benign place. Um, there's, there's not, because it's, because it's so um, dominated by trees, quite low light levels, there isn't the grass there, there aren't the grazing herds, there aren't the big predators. So it's a relatively benign place where the classic idea of extremely hostile environments shaping our survival, those factors weren't anything like as intense and it may have been an environment like that where we could have uh, developed traits that were perhaps less aggressive and less hostile orientated and, and in some ways almost less able to survive in the classic sense. This, this may have been moving in a direction where basic survival was less guaranteed from our basic physiology anyway. But again, do we value that or do we say, well, survival is everything and if our neural system is more primitive and it makes us more aggressive, great, we can survive. Well, we have a choice there. We, we can maintain a very primitive neural system and look at what we're doing and how we experience ourselves. Or is it possible to reconfigure that because we all choose, we all, we all make that choice. We all design and build our own neural system every day of our lives. Can we choose a different direction and start weaving some of these traits back in? Mm. Or do we just want to go down the path we're going and accept that we have no control over it, which I obviously would dispute. I think we have complete control over our, di our, our direction. Yeah. I, I was referring to that particular point in time mm. when that separation occurred, um, but that, that's, that's fine. Let's move on to uh, a different subject, uh, the juvenile state and bipedalism. Can you elaborate a little bit on being juvenile? Uh, in your book, you mentioned a longer period of uh, childhood, yeah. um, greater development, and then bipedalism. Well, I, I was trying to identify disproportionately important areas that might have changed. I, I'm kind of saying everything must have changed, but what were the key areas that changed that had the biggest impact on our neural development and our state of mind? Um, and one of the key areas, again, back to hormones and modifying our own hormones by a perpetual flood of quite alien hormones, very different hormones from plants. Um, and one of, one of the many traits they have is they will modify the very powerful hormones we all produce, as, as I mentioned, testosterone and the estrogens, incredibly powerful. It's, they're the key chemicals that read the blueprint. The blueprint doesn't do anything on its own. DNA is just a, you know, it, it does nothing. It needs to be read in simple language. And hormones are the, the key element in that, particularly testosterone, particularly estrogens. And with this increasing influx of plant hormones, and it, uh, there are variables, it depends on how tight this association gets, how much you specialize in fruit eating. But if you go down that path, you're massively modifying your own hormone regime and part of what happens is the effects of testosterone and estrogen are modified and inhibited. Their effects are, they're still essential but they're, they're ameliorated and less, less active I guess. So the things they normally do which is rapid cycling sort of build an organism very quickly, breed very quickly, successful survival traits those processes are slowed down and the juvenile window can begin to expand. And that's very important for all sorts of reasons, but particularly it gives you time to grow a very unique neural system. I mean, to grow something like we have now, even in its current state, it's very, very complex, it takes a lot of very expensive materials and it takes a lot of time to build. You can't do that if you're flooded with testosterone and estrogens. It just builds very quickly. Mm. Again, great for survival, not so great for these unique traits. So if you start stretching the juvenile window, you can build a radically different neural system. And then I think where it gets interesting, as you build a different neural system, of course, the neural system begins to run our own endocrine system differently. And that's where you start to get into kind of feedback loops where you have a neural system that's I mean, one of the things I proposed is it's, it's, 
it begins pumping things like melatonin, more melatonin. Well, that echoes the very chemistry in, in our diet, talking about diet. The fruit chemistry has a bunch of traits that inhibit our steroids. Well, so does melatonin. So you're kind of plugging in, getting a direct effect from this symbiotic relationship, and it starts producing a new neural system that produces a hormone regime that kind of feeds in as well, and you start getting this acceleration mm. where it's steroid inhibition is one of the factors allowing this extremely long period of development that allows this neural system, this unique neural system to emerge, very different kind of neural architecture, mm. in turn facilitating a very different state of mind. Um, Bi so, bipedalism, can you elaborate on that? Um, bipedalism, well, I, you know, just throwing ideas around because bipedalism was and still is to some degree seen as an adaptation to moving out of the forest. You know, we were pretty stupid. We lived in the forest. Nothing much happened. That's a kind of standard idea. We weren't very bright. We, somehow we got out onto the savannah. How we got from one to the other without adapting. But anyway, we got onto the savannah. We needed bipedalism to run around and hunt. I mean, actually, we're pretty puny animals and humans going head to head with anything on the savannah is a no-go. It's just, you know, uh, it's not, it's not going to come out too well for humans, basically, but that's a standard idea, and, and bipedalism was an adaptation to the savannah. Now, there are other theories, there are other, other ideas. Uh, some people, at least, have observed that bipedalism's an essential part of arboreal living. You know, you, you effectively can walk around the trees, climb in the trees, and being bi bipedal on the forest floor isn't in any way... Um, non-adaptive. It, it could be a useful adaptation. I mean, one of the things I was particularly interested in is where you have the neural system expanding and it reaches a point where it, it, it hasn't reached its full development by the time humans give birth, which again is quite unique in mm. biological evolution. There's this postnatal development window where effectively we're still a fetus. Now that's got to be a pretty massive pressure in the classic adaptive sense if you're semi-arboreal or still arboreal and, and over time there's this, there's this increasingly helpless fetal-like state, um, I, would, I would suggest that's a very strong pressure, uh, almost a, a lethal pressure. If that process is going to continue, you're going to need different means of, of surviving. You're going to need your arms to carry this thing. It's just not going to be able to survive and run around. So we have many practical reasons why we became bipedal. I, I, I'm just saying, I, I'm saying it, it, wasn't, it wasn't necessarily about going out into hostile environments as many people think and there are mechanisms within this symbiotic association that could have led to bipedalism, quite efficient bipedalism that had nothing to do with the savannah and wouldn't have in any way inhibited or, or, or been a negative trait in the forest. Uh, I think being, a, being bi bipedal in the forest isn't a problem at all. I mean, humans still li live in the forest in a very different way. And humans are still much more adept climbers than people realize. If you look at the best of gymnastics or free rock climbing and so on, we're, we're still mm. way more arboreal than most animals. Okay, maybe not as arboreal as orangutans or chimpanzees, but we're still pretty efficient mm. climbers, bearing in mind we're so disconnected now. There's a, a race of people in Copper Canyon, uh, Mexico. I think it's called Copper Canyon. Or, yeah, Copper Canyon. Um, once in a while, <coughs> several times in a month even, the entire village uh, will decide to go for a run. Uh, that run will last two and a half, day, two and a half days. Okay. And old women, old men, children will join the run. And within that two and a half days, they may cover 280 kilometers in one go. And they'll go back and have lunch or whatever, and you know we had a good run, a good okay. jog around. Right. The the evolutionary basis for that understanding is that we are the only animals that can run for such long periods of time. Most animals will just simply collapse if they run for 15, 20 minutes, uh, like humans can do. We can sprint for huge distances. Mm. It it turns out our legs. Um, is adapted to continuously run. Um, run so much, in fact, that we can uh, outrun a horse. We can quite literally keep up with a horse and run it to death. And then we would prey upon it. That's one of the um, evolutionary explanations.
-hmm. But the fact that we have such a unique property to be able to run uh, in such fast distance, there is no animals that can do that. Uh, most animals will have to stop and take a breather at least, you mm -hmm. know. So in that sense, uh, bipedalism would mean a lot to me in a sense that it's something that we have that most, if not all animals, don't actually have. It makes us uh, wonderful predators. That is one way of looking at it. I don't dispute that. Again, there are, there are many theories and ideas and there's quite a lot of determination to find the adaptive traits that explain our hunter-gatherer phase and almost justify our aggression and so on. I, I totally understand that. I'm not remotely convinced by those traits as, as being anything like coherent explanations. I, I totally accept we have phenomenal stamina, particularly in what we call altered states. Um, we can tap into phenomenal strength, stamina, way beyond where we normally can, even with training and so on. Whether those were classic adaptive traits in, in the sense you're talking about to do with hunting, I'm not remotely convinced. I understand they could be, but I, I think it's cherry picking. It's like, well, well, let's fit this bit to that bit. But there's this whole, whole context that I think is missing. I think there's far more coherent explanations if you're willing to at least address the unique nature of the tropical forest, the unique nature of the biochemistry and the unique neural system it has the potential to build. And once you build a different neural system, you have a different management system, it runs our basic physi physiology differently. And, and I think there's enough at least anecdotal evidence that comes out of altered states and how people report them almost dreamlike states. I mean, it's sometimes explained by just purely adrenaline, but uh, you know, it's in the yogic tradition, it's, 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 it's in all sorts of traditions where you can escape the limits of our normal physiological strength and stamina and so on and, and tap into something where, a bit like the example you used, where people can just run and run and run. Is that to do with, with hunting or is that just a phenomenally efficient system that we could use for anything? And sure, if you're desperate to survive and you end up on the savannah, you have high cognitive function, courtesy of the forest, you have an amazing physiology, you survive and you can hunt whatever you like. Is that, is, was the, that just survival? The irony of what I pointed out is that there are farming race and have been since the dawn of time. Uh, there were never hunters. As well, they, there you go then. Yeah. Okay, um, let's go on to another, another <coughs> subject. Airlessness and vitamin D. Okay. Okay, uh, I understand vitamin D being absorbed by the sun. Uh, if you want some of that, you're going to have to lose perhaps quite a lot of hair, uh, like me, perhaps on the top of my head and so on and so forth. Perhaps you can elaborate on airlessness and vitamin D. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a, an area I'd consider a minor piece of the jigsaw, but interesting. And again, what I was trying to do was draw attention to... I mean, I probably mentioned a book at this stage that's considered a bit of a heresy, and I don't support the conclusions in some ways, but um, uh, Elaine Morgan, who wrote a book, or wrote several books on the aquatic ape and scars of evolution, uh, promoting Hardy's work, I think. And I think she did quite a good job of highlighting the weaknesses and the standard ideas of human evolution on the savannah and in these hostile environments. And she was particularly talking about a physiology and so on. Um, our capacity for sweating and our need for water and, and, and other traits. And one of the things I wanted to look at in particular was how well our physiology seems to fit with the non-seasonal tropical forest. I'm not talking about the seasonal forest where there's fruit sometimes, sometimes there isn't, there's quite a lot of predators, it's quite hostile. The much narrower niche of the non-seasonal forest where it's perpetually damp and very, very little sunlight, it's actually very dark on the forest floor. And that in turn, if, if that was our evolutionary home, it must have brought some pressures, particularly to do with our need for vitamin D because we're not getting it much from dietary sources as far as I'm aware. And vitamin D is an incredibly important you know, part of our hormone system and uh, an essential nutrient. So I, I, was, I was just playing around with ideas, well, if we become increasingly adapted to a perpetually warm, very low light environment, there'd be some knock-on effects. And it ties in well with this flood of hormone-modifying diet, 
Um, and hair development, the, the evidence for hair development is very much tied to steroids. I mean, most of us develop a different kind of hair when we reach the age of puberty. That's all to do with hormones. If you wind it back the other way, I'm interested in the idea that some of our nakedness, or very fine hair rather than nakedness, was partly a response to these very low light areas and partly a response to this flood of hormones, which also probably impact on our ability to utilize or the effectiveness of vitamin D, which again we need. So it, it may have been... We, we had to lose the air in order to get to vitamin well, D. Well, I, I accept it's speculative, but nevertheless there may be a better explanation looking at this low light forest environment with a flood of hormones that modify our own hormones almost certainly have an impact on vitamin D. I'm just saying there's some interesting components there that haven't been significantly addressed in the standard theories. It's all out in the savanna and we chased and hunted things, um, yet we still retained this hairlessness, we still sweat in a profligate manner in an environment that doesn't have much water. You switch to the non-seasonal tropics, there's water everywhere, there's food you know, dropping off the trees year round. What might emerge from that kind of environment? So some of it, some of it is speculative, but the components all seem to be in the right place. So I'm just saying, with hairlessness and relating that to vitamin D and so on and so forth, we, we've got a very, a very radically different hormone environment in the forest. And hair growth, hair development is very, very closely tied with hormones, including our sebaceous glands. They don't, sebaceous glands don't develop pretty much till we reach puberty. Well, with this flood of chemistry, I'm saying puberty was delayed, and in fact, it would never, we would never have developed the gender differences to the extreme we do now. And that would have affected all sorts of our physiology. We would have been different and closer to each other in our physiology and how our brains worked. Mm -hmm. So all these things, I think, tie together. And I think there's a, a debris trail that looks much more coherent as forest origins and then coming out of the forest causes problems rather than honing our advanced traits. We got it back to front. That's my proposal anyway. Mm. Next subject, protein, fatty acids and water. Okay. If you can uh, keep your <coughs> answers um, as narrow as possible, uh, that would be good. And if you're going to pluck examples, if you can uh, equate it by name, that would be good. Okay, well, um. I'll talk a little bit about fatty acids and see how it comes together. Um, our, our neural system is, is a colossus of a neural system relative to our body size. It's, it's almost unique in the fossil record. I mean, some animals have bigger brains, but their body size is much bigger, elephants, whales and so on. For an animal of our size, our neural system is extraordinarily large. Some of the extinct and extant apes have equally or, or similarly large neural systems, but they're pretty rare. And the superstructures, mostly, or a, a big percentage of it is made from uh, fats, what we call essential fatty acids. We can't make them ourselves, we have to get them from somewhere else. And they're particularly volatile. They, in nature, fatty acids are always heavily protected. Um, some of the sources of them, whether they be in animals or in plants, for example, in seeds, they're wrapped in what we call antioxidants, vitamin E, vitamin C, layer upon layer of protection. Because at room temperature they'll oxidise. And oxidise is a structural change, it's a kind of rusting, it's damage. So I'm particularly, I was particularly interested, I think, with that section of the book, looking at the idea, well, in the forest we had access to essential fatty acids and they were still highly protected. We were eating them as part of uh, our, our natural diet in leaves and in the seeds and fruit because a lot of fruit have edible seeds. It's part of the treat. It's part of the symbiotic association. Not all seeds are edible, but a lot were. And many are rich in essential fatty acids. And they come loaded with antioxidants. So we can process them by chewing them and digesting them, but that doesn't break the protection. And they come into a system in pristine condition and they, they're part of cell membranes and then of course part of our nervous system and particularly part of our neural system, this highly delicate, highly sensitive piece of equipment. So I think you contrast that with the idea of going out onto the savannah where essential fatty acids are very rare, 
to get access to them you have to hunt, which clearly we're capable of, I'm not disputing that. Um, and in order to process some of this stuff, obviously we, we started moving towards heating, heating the food with, with fire and so on. And that radically changes the molecular structure and particularly with fatty acids, remember they're very volatile. So what we started doing with this phenomenally unique structure, instead of building it from pristine and highly protected unoxidized fatty acids, we moved towards taking the fatty acids out of the protective environment, heating them at non-biological temperatures in free oxygen, so they're highly oxidized. And remember, we can't do anything with them then. Our system isn't able to then process them any further. So we're taking oxidized fatty acids and building this incredibly complex superstructure from basically damaged goods. And I think that was another step towards the generation. I mean, it's got a lot worse. You know, we're now chronically deficient in essential fatty acids, and by the time we get any of them, they've been beaten the hell out of, microwave, baked, ste whatever the hell we do to them. Then we build the most complex thing we know from them, and we kind of wonder why it doesn't work. And we're also missing all the additional protection that came with a flood of antioxidants that these days, we, we're lucky if we get 1% of what we would have got in the tropical forests. Um, I, I mean, I... I, I you know, some very basic calculations done on analysis of fruit and pharmacology and so on. We're missing a minimum, you know, we've lost a minimum of 95% of the flood of antioxidants that our neural system would have been bathed in 24-7 for millions of years. So now we build it from oxidized fatty acids and there's nothing there to protect it. Mm. That's insane to think that that's not going to have a massive impact. Absolutely. And then, then we look at the prevalence of Alzheimer's and dementia. I, I, I take it a step further and say we're all suffering from a form of dementia from quite early on. It just gets worse mm. and we don't even recognise it I'll, anymore. I'll touch upon that uh, later on. Okay, well that's uh, part of the context. That's where it ends up going. Yeah. Um, protein, if you can quickly describe protein. Um, going back to the book, I mean, I, I, I barely read the book since it was published because it used to drive me, you know, I read so many drafts of it. But I think I was talking about, there's, there's a lot of mythology, particularly in... Western science. I mean, I, I consider Western nutrition as a pseudoscience. I mean, I'm often considered as a heretic or this, this is a pseudoscience, but it's built on absolutely nothing. It's got nothing to do with biological evolution. Um, it's not based on a physiology. It's, it's almost as if we looked at what we were eating 150 years ago in, in quite a de de degenerate state in hostile climates, and that was the basis of Western nutrition, and it's inched towards little bits of, oh, we'll eat a little bit of fruit, eat some vegetables. All this other stuff's got nothing to do with biology at all. Um, and then there's this obsession that we need protein, an awful lot of protein. Well, actually, what we need is amino acids. Mm. And amino acids are abundant in a plant-based diet. And the time we need the, so, most, the, the most protein of all when we're growing and expanding is, is our developmental phase and breastfeeding. So well, breast milk isn't particularly rich in protein. Human breast milk isn't. It's more sweet and it's more fat, which hints at a more of a neural development formula. And, and our neural system itself, again, it's another mythology that we needed protein to build a neural system. Um, our neural system is percentage-wise less rich in amino acids and protein than a lot of the rest of our physiology. It's a total misnomer. We don't need a lot of protein. In fact, it's quite toxic protein. So I, I was just throwing that into the mix that we got it back to front. The idea that protein was a limiting factor in the forest is completely absurd. There's no basis for it whatsoever. We now gorge ourselves on protein and it causes all sorts of problems and it's got nothing to do with neural development or function. They call that the protein myth, do they not? I think some people do. I mean, there's yeah. many different takes on it. You know, I'm, I'm just picking on individual that's, that's pieces and saying it's another myth, but we've all bought it. Well, as a, you know, as, as a culture, we've bought into it. Yeah. If you look at the basic physiology, the basic mechanisms, there's no support there for it at all. Neural systems aren't rich in amino acids. They're slightly less rich than, say, our muscles. Well, clearly, animals can build very big muscles on a plant-based diet, so protein isn't a limiting factor. End of. I find it very difficult. It's actually quite difficult to give a simple, rational answer. I want to paint the picture each time. Mm. And I know I've got a distill that down and do it more simply, but I, you know, Pictorial, you asked me a question and I, I, want, language is beautiful. I want to fill all the gaps in before I 
you know, and, and uh, you know, yeah, it's that's, uh, yeah, it, it's yeah. a that's that's what your audience really will do. Mm. They put. I know. I know. To, this is, this is what I need to yeah. learn. You know. Otherwise, it becomes preaching. Oh, In your yeah. other uh, topic, you have new theory of inheritance. Can you elaborate on that for me, please? Okay. Um, yeah. Well, this this is um, really trying to point out the very well evidenced, very well understood mechanisms that can run parallel with classic adaptive selection, genetic mutation, or in some cases almost in place of, or certainly in more dominant means of evolution, I guess, and that's to do with, I guess, the modern term for its epigenetics. It's, it's instead of it being, I guess, simply instead of it being about changes in our DNA, which build different structure and there's environmental pressures that lead to different traits and so on, this the standard model. I'm particularly interested in sort of situations where the same blueprint can be read very differently and consistently differently so you end up with an evolution based on a change in transcription the way the way the blueprint is read um, now there's nothing new in this but there's been such a focus since DNA was discovered and elucidated and so on such a focus on the changing the code different structure and it seems like a perfectly good model but it's it, it's some it's it's led to this sort of transcription environment being somewhat ignored. I mean, it's, it's, it's getting more and more interesting. The last 10, 15, 20 years, more and more people have been looking at, at the developmental environment. And what I was particularly interested in was an evolutionary context for a very different developmental environment, a, 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 an environment that would read the DNA differently, not just for one generation, but for tens of thousands, maybe millions of years not at the expense of classic adaptive selection, but in tandem with, but that being a much more dominant effect. So uh, what I was putting together was the idea that um, during early development in the uterus, there was scope to massively change that environment in a stable way. So you'd end up with, with radically different traits. They could emerge very quickly. We, we already know that the mechanisms are fairly well understood that you can, you can change basic structure, basic physiology, and therefore function and perception and so on, just by altering the developmental environment. We know from all sorts of examples, some of them quite challenging, so sort of congenital damage, um, uh, chemical imbalances during development, hormone imbalances during development, they will have a massive impact. So using those examples to demonstrate the principle, or what I really was saying is, or what I've been saying is that, look, the developmental environment of, of the human brain was massively altered by these hormones from plants, not just for a week, not just for a year, but for millions of years. And I, I, I think it's a, a relatively unique situation. The, the, on, the only place that can happen is if you have sustained modification. And the symbiotic relationship I'm talking about is, is a relationship with the plant, effectively the plant uterus. The only place that can happen is in the non-seasonal tropical forests. Well, lo and behold, that's where all these unusual traits seem to come from. So I'm saying that was a much more dominant effect than is currently being recognized, modifying the developmental environment massively. Um, and that's where we were evolving for millions of years. And that's where all these traits came from. And again, you lose that environment, by definition, there'll be an equally massive change. Maybe it's great. Maybe we're, you know, moving in a good direction. On the other hand, maybe we're not. Mm, thank, thank you. Um, the first primate, what, what does that mean, first primate? I'm visualizing something that was that one-voiced creature. That's what I used to call it as a, as a child. Mm. Um, are, are you talking about our perception now? You, you have a topic here called the first primates. Right. Um, you might have to remind me then. Um, okay. At a particular point in our history, uh, we were this one-voiced uh, okay. creature. Uh, the first primates, uh, you call them primates, not human. Um, are, we, are we talking about a different species here? Um, Okay, well, we're so used to looking at things as individual species. I, I'm really saying it's a sort of uh, 
an interconnected organism with different strands and different traits and so on. And, and really, it's the, it's the connection between a very distant ancestor. Modern science tells us it's some kind of insect-eating small animal that ended up in the trees, eating insects, chasing them into the flowers, and eventually this symbiotic union with fruit and so on. Um, and, and, and the physiology being massively altered by this relationship. I guess then moving on to the point where that relationship began to have a significant effect on, particularly on the neural system and perception, and I, I guess I'm interested in a hypothetical point where um, something that we would currently describe as being aware of being aware, sort of self-awareness, began to emerge. I don't know exactly when that was, I guess nobody does for sure. Okay. Um, that's, that's fine, I, I yeah. think that explains it. Is that the implications of agriculture? Can you elaborate on that for, for me, please? Especially the bit where you speak about we feeding on grass, um, yeah. grass seeds, uh, taking to cultivation, tubers um, yeah, of the earth, yeah. and so on and so forth. Uh, starchy, <clears throat> rich diet. Yeah, implications of agriculture. Well, just briefly, it, it sort of move from the forest through the hunter-gatherer stage and generally seen as being part of our evolution in a positive way and then moving towards agriculture. I think it's all back to front and each, each process is a more degenerative step and what we've ended up with agriculture, where it's ended up is we've ended up cultivating at, at the very, in the very best case scenario, they'd normally be called fallback foods, kind of secondary foods that primates might eat in times of difficulty. Um, that's at best, so some of the roots and tubers and so on that we've begun to cultivate. And then we've moved sideways and in a different direction, particularly with grass seed. And I use the word grass seed quite intentionally because it's, we've, most of us have grown up with things like the idea of wheat and barley and corn and, and so on and so forth. They're, they're mostly all forms of grass. Mm. Arable land. Yeah, arable, yeah. arable is and, grass. Yeah. Um, and grass seed is absolutely got nothing to do with primate evolution, primate biochemistry. Grass seed, the seed doesn't want to be eaten. It's not a symbiotic relationship. It's heavily defended. It's not particularly nutritious. Um, you know, rodents eat it. Some birds eat it. Well, they don't have amazing neural systems. The only way we can eat it in any significant quantity is process the hell out of it because it's quite toxic and causes a lot of problems. And there's evidence in recorded history, skeletal size, diseases that started creeping in, the more, the more grass seed we process, the more grass seed we cultivated. And we're now dominated, you know, grass, grass seed is a massive part of modern culture diet and it's got absolutely nothing to do with our evolution. It's quite toxic and the only way we can eat it is grind it, bake it, microwave it, process it. And then again, we, we're building the most complex thing we know from a material that's got nothing in it and is quite toxic. Mm -hmm. And I think agriculture generally is headed in that direction. We've, we've taken survival foods at best, sometimes even worse than that, and made them our staple. And, you know, very simplistically, basic engineering, you are what you eat. It's like we've shifted from the most advanced factory to build the most advanced computer chips and it's all air controlled, dust controlled, electromagnetic. And we're now making them in an old shed from bits of cardboard and stuff and we wonder why it doesn't work very well. Thank you. With, with junk food, um, you've, you've actually covered quite a lot about junk food already, uh, even agriculture is junk food. Yeah. If you can uh, comment on contemporary junk food um, and the degeneration, sure, the, further, the further degeneration. Well it, it's, it, it's a mixture of incredible sorrow I think and also ironic that we even treat it as a joke that's part of the psychology of where we're at let alone the basic biology and I think all these steps from hunter-gatherer through agriculture and into the recent junk era the last 50 years and so on um, it's it's shocking really that, that we we live in an age where that's acceptable even if it's slightly derided, that again, we're building the most advanced thing we know, the most advanced molecular structure that effectively runs everything we do and makes every decision we make or plays a part in it from something not only we laughingly call junk, 
but it's, it's worse than junk. It's the, it's the cheapest, most poorest quality stuff. It's processed to hell. It's got nothing to do with our origins. And we feed it to our kids. We feed it to them when they're, they should still be breastfeeding. Uh, they're fed it at school and they're addicted to it and they eat it for the rest of their lives by degrees. Again, basic engineering. The idea that we can build something from utter, utter rubbish. The most, the most, you'd have to sit a lot of clever people in a room for a long time to invent such a ludicrous diet mm. and yet that's become embedded in our culture. Thank you, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, these are what appears to be mental illnesses, uh, multiple, personal sin uh, multi -person multiple personality syndrome, uh, confabrication is uh, one that I'll be touching upon as long as I can. You'll have to dig in deep for that one. Okay. Uh, deeper into fear, higher function. <coughs> um, first of all, what is this word? Uh, hemi, uh, hemispheric conotomy. <laughs> well, there's a few terms in there. Um, just drawing from the academic tradition, there. You know, the uh, academics like the concepts and their terms, and uh, try to use them wherever appropriate. Really, all, all I was doing, I mean, part of, you know, the, the core of my proposal is the whole of humanity is suffering from a very serious, species-wide, very serious neurological condition. It's not that a few people have got it, everybody's got it, and it's really serious, and our perception has been severely affected across the board. Some people have it slightly worse than others, that's all. Now, there's no way I can get away with that. There's no way I can make such an extreme proposal if there's not a mountain of evidence. We may not have looked for it, or we may not have recognized it because of the condition itself. So all I've tried to do is begin looking at places where you'd expect there to be evidence. Obviously, obviously our behavior. Well, we could talk for days on how crazy human behavior is from personal relationships to governmental level to national level absolutely insane we're hell-bent on destroying ourselves you know most of our resources are pumped into increasingly advanced machinery to kill other humans that's that's what western economies are based on i don't need to know anymore that we're clinically insane however moving on from that what i was interested in trying to highlight is there must be evidence somewhere there must be evidence in the neurological liter literature because modern science one thing it has done is generated a mountain of data more data than we could ever need if we can just figure out the right questions to ask. So what I was interested in is, can we ask different questions and will there be evidence there? So in the tradition of debating, I guess, it's a case of saying, well, let's just, for the sake of argument, accept the possibility that we have, we're mentally ill and it's affecting our ability to see this data in context, to, to actually see what's staring us in the face, as you might get with somebody who has dementia. Once you do that and you start trawling the literature, all this stuff is screaming out. The, the, the research on split brain patients in particular, or where people have had some or part of one of the hemispheres removed, or there's been congenital damage or accidental damage, um, or studies that have involved different neurochemical regimes and so on. And it all seems to point to the fact that one side of our brain is incredibly dysfunctional. Incredibly dysfunctional. The traits that it, that it displays as normal or exactly the same traits as that we would that we would assign to a psychopath and a very stupid psychopath at that exactly the same traits now interestingly of course the same data saying that side of our brains perceptually dominant so you end up in this wonderful situation where the the data is coming up the researchers generating the data and everybody who's read their reports they're assessing the data and writing the conclusions well, that's, that's an impossibly dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. It's like me saying to you, look, Mark, I'm afraid to tell you you've got severe dementia, but here, you write your own report, write your own prescription, and that'll be fine. That would be negligence of the highest order. We should have stopped dead in our tracks once we spotted this data. But the ironic thing is, the data, the neurological data is saying the left side of our brain is deluded, can't, can't perceive reality appropriately, it lies all the time, it confabulates, it makes up stories to fill in things it doesn't like and it doesn't even know it's doing it. It's, it's quite frightened, it's cognitively very, very limited in its capacity, but it dominates. So before we got to the conclusions, we should have stopped. 
but we didn't because we have the condition. The research, some of the most eminent researchers who've studied this phenomena for 30, 40 years, I think their data is excellent. They've, they've brought up this fantastic data. It's highlighting this condition as plain as day and it correlates fantastically well with the ancient traditions. Then they go on to invent these incredulous explanations that, well, it must be adaptive selec selection. We need these traits. They're, they're useful to us somehow. It's just, an, it's just a bunch of inventions to gloss over something that doesn't make sense. And they all forget with one accord that they've all got a left hemisphere. So they're saying, yes, humans have a left hemisphere that has all these unusual traits. Their specialized adaptation in this book, in this book, they're psychopathic traits. Well, which is it? It's in charge as well. Mm. And they forget they've got a left hemisphere, so they come up with these conclusions that have nothing to do with the data. Yeah. Exactly as the data predicts. It's fantastic. And I'd invite anybody, you know, anybody who watches this interview, go check out the split brain data again. Don't buy into the conclusions. Don't buy into the dismissal that it's really too simplistic and it's not like that. Have another look at the data and look at what's writing the conclusions, what's writing the interpretations. It must be the left hemisphere. And the data is saying, don't trust it to go to the shops, let alone write a neurological report. It's, it's clinically insane and it's in charge. One of the parts of our human mind that fascinates me most is its ability to come up with incredibly absurd answers. Mm. Uh, Self-fulfilling prophecies, uh, huge gigantic leaps in faith, uh, completely dismissing the obvious just so it can justify its rationale. Yeah. And you call this uh, in your book confabrication. Uh, can you give me two very dramatic examples of what confabrication does? Um, if you can get straight to the point, that would be good. Yeah, well, I, 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 I think we see it everywhere, including the culture we live in, the decisions that are made, but specifically, I suppose, one of the, some, some of the classic examples that highlight it in its, in its extreme form, where you have patients where the left hemisphere is more isolated through injury and so on, so its traits are more obvious. It's not that they disappear, they're just more obvious. And you'll, you'll have patients where there's... Um, paralysis on one side, they've had a stroke, so they, the um, one side of their brain's been damaged and uh, there's partial or significant paralysis and when the patients questioned about their situation and even the paralysis, the stories that they will concoct and just invent to explain this are a phenomenal confabulation. They, have bare, they obviously have no relation to real, relationship with reality at all. Now they're extreme examples but those traits crop up in all of us by degree. They're just a little bit more diluted because we draw on our right hemisphere. But in an isolated left brain patient, um, even when uh, the, the patient with the paralyzed arms asked to pick something up or to move something or to walk and so on, they will, they will say that's what they're doing or they'll say they're feeling tired today and they don't feel like doing it and so on. Just, just pretty obviously blatant lies, that delusion, no, no connection with reality at all. And that's quite consistent and it never seems to occur the other way on. If, if, um, if the right hemisphere is damaged, our access to a little bit more reality goes. The left hemisphere is much more in charge and it's just complete... Um, delusion from start to finish. Switch it the other way and there's, there's still a pretty solid connection with reality. In fact it's often perceived people with more left hemisphere damage they're often more depressed. Well I'd say that's an appropriate response not only to their condition but to the world we inhabit. A left hemisphere can be quite um, facile almost in its approach to things. It's like we're living in very devastating times and it's quite cheery and quite optimistic, in an, inappropriately optimistic about the condition of the individual or, or the world it inhabits. And that's the world we live in. We sort of blithely go on as if, as if things can continue. Uh, you know, I'm extrapolating from the patients now. This kind of confabulation and delusion is endemic in everybody and, and more so in certain people who want to be in control. So we end up with people more prone to confabulation running the show 
which we 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 see what that results in. You mentioned absurd decisions. Well, there isn't a day goes by where there's not a whole list of absurd decisions being made by a relatively small minority of clearly insane people on behalf of everybody else. We all know this. This isn't anything new. Mm. Well, I'm saying Thank this. You. The solid neurology behind this. Those two, yeah. Let's take one topic, melatonin. What does, there's a specific question, so you don't need to generalise or elaborate. What does melatonin do in the body? Melatonin, well, this, as far as we know, melatonin has many functions. It's, um, it's a hormone, it's neuroactive, so it, it plays an active role in brain function and perception and so on. It's highly antioxidant, so it's very protective. Um, it's related to regulation of things like the juvenile phase, sexual maturity, um, some links with sleep patterns and so on and so forth. So it does an awful lot of things. I'm, I'm particularly interested in its capacity to alter our, our own hormone regime and this goes into extending juvenile windows. I mean there's a, there's a good correlation with, with relatively high levels of melatonin when we're young and they start dropping and changing round about the age of puberty. So the, the, the effective ratio between melatonin and the sex steroids, testosterone and estrogen again, begins to change. And that eventually triggers sexual maturity. Um, and if you had too little melatonin in your body, what would that mean? Um, I think in, in regard to developmental windows, you'd, you'd go into puberty earlier. That would be part of what would and happen. And too much? Too much? What is too much? I don't know what too much is. I, I suspect we, we had a higher level of melatonin all through our lives, partly, and, and again the biochemistry is very good, the evidence is very good in, on this, that the biochemistry in fruit in particular, um, it's, it's quite rich in a, a bunch of compounds called monoamine oxidase inhibitors. They're a kind of neuroactive chemical. And one of the few ways you can change pineal activity is to take monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Pharma, uh, pharmaceutical mono, monoamine oxidase inhibitors will change pineal activity. It will pump more melatonin. Well, interestingly enough, our archaic rainforest diet was rich in monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So the inference is, by ingesting this unique biochemistry, it was elevating the activity of our pineal, pumping more melatonin, which was feeding back into this effect and delaying the onset of puberty, giving our brain more time to develop, and also protecting our brain. It's a powerful antioxidant. So we had all the fruit antioxidants protecting our brain. We were also pumping more melatonin, which protected our brain. Well, you lose one and you start losing the other because they're closely linked. Mm -hmm. And even, I mean, this study's been done, you know, even today, if you get into more altered states, particularly with uh, meditation, if, if you're a practiced meditator, and you're shifting out of the chattering voice, which seems to be the left brain. Remember, it's running our physiology. It's running our sense of self, who we think we are. It's also running everything else. I would suggest very poorly, in a very primitive way. If you start shifting into the relics of more advanced function, of course, you feel differently. Everything's different, including how it runs the pineal and the endocrine system. And you start pumping more melatonin. That still exists today. Why thank on earth you. is that there? Yeah, thank you. Um, the immune system. If you can say something quickly in contrast, the immune system of um, the creature that we once was and the creature that we are now. If you can make that as specific as possible, yep. because you've, you've, you've ironically have given incredible amounts of elaboration. Mm -hmm. You know, all the elaboration uh, I need is there. Uh, I need you to be a little you bit need some more, more detail, yeah. Uh, more specific. Is okay, well, I, I focused on the thymus gland, gland um, and because it's considered, and I think it's probably correct, that it's pretty much the hub of the immune system. It's a, a significant part of the immune system. Obviously, it's linked with the brain, and obviously, they're all part of a much more holistic system. But the thymus gland, in particular, is like the center of the immune system. And it's relatively large when we're young, it shrinks at puberty, in, interestingly enough. And it's very, it's very sensitive to steroids, testosterone and estrogen, okay? So, as already discussed, the biochemistry of our ancestral diet, the fruits inhibit testosterone and estrogen. Our ancestral diet also pumps more melatonin, so that inhibits testosterone and estrogen. And what you end up with in principle 
is um, a much more expanded thymus gland that doesn't shrink anything like as much, if at all, at puberty. It perhaps maintained much higher function for much longer, possibly into old age. Remember, if you're flooding our system all the time, not just once in a while, but every day with this cocktail of chemicals, it would be, to put it one way, it would be thymus gland friendly. It's protecting the thymus gland from our own primitive hormones. You strip that away, the thymus gland reacts, particularly as we move into puberty, start shrinking, and our immune system isn't anything like as effective as it could be. And again, interestingly, I think you, you, that, that'd, be, that'd be fine, you, yeah, because these examples you've already given... Well, yeah, uh, I was just going to say the archaic tradition talks about phenomenal health and longevity. I'm, ju I'm just saying there's a correlation in the ancient traditions. They don't prove anything. Fascinating that they exist. Um, man and Superman. Can you elaborate on that? Because I understand that as George Bernard Shaw's work, okay. Man and Superman, but you've got your man... Uh, Superman and Superwoman. So if you can elaborate for me, please. Well, I, I just wanted to look briefly at uh, my, my, my main interest is consciousness, our state of mind, perception, insanity, and so on. But I, I wanted to look at how our neural system is integral to every part of our existence, including our physicalness, our, our strength, our stamina, our coordination, our balance, and so on. And the idea is we're currently running on a very inefficient, relatively primitive side of our brain. And the idea is that when that was still working or when we access the side of the brain, the right side of the brain that still has these, some of these traits, um, it's not that we need to train, it's not that we need to do stuff, we just, everything starts working better. We have better strength, better stamina, better coordination, all sorts of abilities that, that are locked away normally but occasionally come out through mm -hmm. techniques or approaches or spontaneously. I would like and, to and, give and you we, some examples. Um, I, just, I, I was just going to say briefly, we, we, we would have been a phenomenally more, you know, we wouldn't have been sat in the corner like some stone hippie going, wow, this is nice, man. I mean, it would have felt a bit like that, but we would have been highly functional as well. That's the point I want to make. Mm -hmm. Physiology, uh, physically, very, very functional. Much better balance, much better strength, much better stamina, because we have a more efficient system. So that's the point I wanted to make. Yeah, so sports people quite often speak about being in the zone, yeah. which I understand is being in the subconscious frame of mind. Certainly more so, yes. I also know from personal experience as well as testimonies from other people, vast, uh, vast scales of testimony, um, when our subconscious mind takes over our, uh, our psychomotor skills, <clears throat> it does it thousands of times more effectively. Exactly. Uh, 50 calories now become the equivalent to 10,000 calories yeah. to the conscious mind. Yes, yes. So you have people that have crashed in the middle of nowhere mm. and climbed mountains after mountains that they have never climbed before yeah. and they've not lost much weight over the whole yes. period. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we have woven in a little bit to some of the mystic traditions like yeah. the Zen tradition, the martial arts tradition, which they were really trying to access the mind that could do all that stuff. The training was like the tail wagging the dog and eventually they get to the place where it just works and it's got nothing to do with training, it just mm. fucking works, you know. Indeed. Yeah. What is it? What is the pineal gland? The, the pineal gland, um, <coughs> it's, a, it's a small gland that sits more or less between the hemispheres. Um, it has its own blood supply and it's considered part of the endocrine system, the hormone system, and it pumps a cocktail of chemicals including melatonin um, other chemicals like penaline, which are neuroactive, and they have a profound effect on all aspects of our physiology, particularly on the brain, but everywhere, including our immune system and so on. And um, it seems to be hinted at in ancient tradition, whether it's accurate or not, it's difficult to say. But looking at the biochemistry of our ancient diet... I that think that would be fine. Yeah. Transcranial magnetic stimulation. What a mouthful. Can you elaborate for me, please? Transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, yeah, I, I, only passing interest really. I, again, I, I was looking for clues in the modern or ancient literature that might support this idea that one side of our brain was less functional than the other. And people have come up with all sorts of approaches. One guy in particular, although his work's been partly replicated in Australia, um, he was looking at, I, I think he got interested in savant syndrome, how, how people with some degrees of dysfunction in in the normal sense 
could have these phenomenal abilities and he, he was still interested in the idea of adaptive selection, trading one set of skills for another and so on. But he came up with the idea, well if we can partly inhibit the modern rational mind, the advanced mind as it's often seen, seen would we be able to access these relatively primitive skills, albeit that they're superlative skills? So he, he was um, obviously had a background in medical research and so on, and he started getting into the idea that if we can relatively safely switch off some or all of the left brain, we might get access. So he set up experiments, I think, uh, probably in the early 90s when I first got in touch with him. And he, he was using focused magnetic, electromagnetic beams to try and temporarily inhibit the parts of the left hemisphere. And I think people thought he was completely crazy. However, and he bearing in mind he's using normal subjects and of course I consider us all currently abnormal but he what he's getting is quite good results clearly enough data suggesting that by inhibiting inhibiting the left hemisphere some of the classic right hemisphere skills memory creativity artistic performance and so on can definitely be enhanced by some degrees just by inhibiting the left hemisphere so it, it's more, again, it's more just a clue. It's not proof in itself, but it's certainly another clue that if you can dampen down the left hemisphere, which I think is what people have been trying to do forever with various techniques like meditation, you can get some extra access. It's not completely black and white, but some enhancement. Thank you. Do you want to come? Um, just 30 seconds on this one, if you can. Uh, once again, just reach for that specific question. Um, because I've got a lot of body of thoughts, what you, what you say, mm. so I'm not short of that at all. Yeah, okay, I'm getting, I'm getting what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. uh, weak electric magnetic, sorry, I beg your pardon, weak electromagnetic fields, just elaborate on that. Um, okay, weak electromagnetic fields, that's almost certainly talking about Michael Persinger's research. And uh, similar to Alan Snyder in Australia with TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, Michael Persinger was taking a different approach. He was looking kind of at it from the other perspective. Can you stimulate the right hemisphere and can you get any additional experiential results? And so he, he decided to use specific frequencies, quite weak fields, and effectively trying to stimulate the right hemisphere, perhaps in a similar way that some psychedelic drugs can. He's inter also interested in psychedelic use as well. And again, he got some interesting results. The correlation seems to be there inhibit the left or stimulate the right and you start getting some hints of what might be called mystical or alternative states of mind. So again, the correlations are looking good. And these are measurable with devices? Um, measurable in the way that um, academics can measure experiential, psychological reports, subjective reports, what people report. So yes, some measurable data, definitely. I mean, uh, whether it be called rock solid, I don't really know, but s certainly the the reports that his subjects come back with strongly correlate with the, the, the techniques he's using. Okay. Um, feel free to elaborate on this, but not too much on the outskirts. Transcription. We, we spoke about epigenetics, but it's such a new science, so perhaps uh, you might elaborate on uh, transcription. This, but transcription really is just a term for um, how you get from it could, I mean, using a simple example like a, a, an architect's blueprint, how you turn the blueprint into a house. Um, well, the blueprint, again, it does nothing on its own. So the, the idea is a DNA, it, it, it's, it's seen as the code, the blueprint and so on, and may well be. Well, it's the environment it's placed in, or the environment, how, how that affects it, the hormonal environment. It's often called the transcription environment, how the code is transcribed or written up as structure and there's a mass of variables there and that's a much more fertile area for looking at and it's slowly been recognized that the transcription environment's pretty much everything the code is inert does nothing of course we we've grown up with the idea that um, we understand a transcription environment we know what the human transcription environment is and i think there's some truth in that of course our origins it wasn't the human transcription environment it was back to this symbiotic transcription environment totally different ball game and I think that's, that's where transcription is particularly important in this, uh, in this idea. The environment in which the DNA was read, and that has a massive impact on the structure, therefore the function, perception, everything. Mm -hmm. 
Can you say a little bit about sleep deprivation? You, you it's not sleep deprivation. It's, it's the, I mean, I'm fascinated by it. And it's an ancient tradition. It's part of Vision Quest. It crops up in prolonged meditation. Um, and I think there's a good explanation for that as well. Um, my hesitation slightly that I, I did a bit of a PR stunt a few years ago, which kind of worked. It got a lot of attention, but didn't work out very well in the direction I wanted it to work. You know, there wasn't much interest in why I did it. So mm -hmm. it was kind of a missed opportunity. So I'm, I'm not so keen on talking about my personal experiments uh, in terms of the media, but certainly why sleep deprivation is an ancient approach to shifting our state of mind and how it might correlate with sleepwalking and lucid dreams and so on and so forth. And really, all I've proposed is that particularly with human sleep, and bearing in mind I'm saying humans aren't at optimal function, we're quite, we've degenerated a lot, um, I'm saying one side of our brain is very inefficient. It, it effectively has weak batteries, but that's the side we're running on, and it's perceptually dominant. So it runs the show for 12, 16, 18 hours, and its batteries are getting weak, and we feel tired, and it's a very dominant feeling. We get irritable, our speech starts to slur, we become clumsy. Most of us don't question that, because, of course, the thing that's questioning that is the thing that's tired. So we just go to bed, recharge, and we live in this cycle of the rational mind recharging itself every day. However, and it's not difficult to understand the concept, if we have much stronger batteries in the right side of the brain, because it's still much more functional in principle, you stay awake long enough, or you meditate for long periods, or whatever you want to, you know, trance dance, the ancient traditions of partying for days on end and so on, basically you're starving the rational mind, the egotistical mind of sleep, and its batteries are running down. And of course, it doesn't feel very good, it feels tired, but if you push beyond that, its ability to stay in charge starts to break down as well. And that's where you can start to get glimpses of access to the other side of the brain, the other self. And of course, it's embedded in ancient tradition, exactly as I'd expect. There's nothing new in staying awake to reach a different state. It's not understood anymore, it's often seen as it must be some kind of primitive n nonsense, but it was embedded in, it's, it's still a living tradition in sort of North American tradition, South American tradition. Uh, it's kind of tied in with the Buddhist tradition, the Buddhist staying while well, meditating for seven days before you reached an altered state. Crops up a lot. Mm. Counterintuitive, but actually if you step back, it makes a lot of sense. And most people, if you ask them, I've spoken to a lot of people about this, most people have recollections of they've been a partying or they've been working hard. And sure, they get tired, but within, within that, they get glimpses of something else, a kind of softness, a, a more relaxed state, often more emotional, because again, there's more access to that emotional side of the brain, and even feeling quite good, quite an altered state for brief windows, or getting a second wind even. You know, be really, really tired, no sleep, and then suddenly feeling fine for half an hour or an hour. Mm. So all I really did, or, or what I was interested in, is making sense of that, and is it possible to exploit that, and bring in combining techniques to tie the left side of the brain up, which initially doesn't feel great, but the reward on the other side of that makes it worth the effort. Thank you very much. Um, when I asked you, is there any other topics that you wish to speak about, you sent me an email, and one of them was on uh, oxytocin, uh, M MDMA. Um, I'll leave you to elaborate on that, and, and a couple of other things. Um, Let's say oxytocin. Um, well, I, I was just, again, interested in looking at, I, I, I'm basically saying we're in trouble and the left side of our brain that's currently dominant is highly dysfunctional and it's running, our, it's running everything poorly, uh, which is quite a gloomy picture. But I'm, I'm equally saying that we have a phenomenal amount of function locked away and we also know an awful lot about how to get at it if we were to just step back and accept there's a problem here. And really simple examples, sim single molecules or single classes of substances which cannot possibly replace the thousands of chemicals that were there in the rainforest, but they clearly have some impact like MDMA or oxytocin and so on. Most people who take those substances judiciously and carefully with, without the ignorance that Western cultures fostered can have a massive shift in consciousness just by taking these relatively small amounts of molecules. So my point is that although we may be in deep trouble, the means of shifting our state of mind is already well known to us. I'm not saying these things are solutions in themselves, and I'm not saying we're deficient in MDMA. I'm saying that there's a lot of evidence that we can shift our state of mind with great ease, and actually holding on to our current 
neural configuration is clearly insane. We know what it does. We know our current state of mind is very dangerous. That's, and that's fine. Fine. The opiates, they're naturally occurring in our body. So you might need to say something like that, that they do naturally occur. You know, the opiates do occur. Ecstasy does occur in our body. Uh, when we take heroin, we feel like heroes. And yeah. you might need to elaborate just a little bit on well, that. Well, yeah, we, we, we clearly have capacity for feeling very different directly correlating to the neurochemical regime we have and all the orthodox evidence supports the idea that we had a vastly more complex neurochemical cocktail as I say that the, the, the tropical forests produce a cocktail of chemis chemicals that the pharmaceutical companies can't even begin to understand it was so complex it was there for millions of years during this evolutionary process so effectively we're now chronically neurochemically deficient, I mean chronically neurochemically deficient. The idea that people defend our autonomous neurochemical regime as being a good thing is insane. We're actually desperately chronically short. No wonder we're susceptible to drug use and misuse and getting into trouble and so on. We need, and our neural system is designed to run on a vast, vast cocktail of chemicals. So not surprisingly we self-medicate and there are tra traditions that have learned to partially self-medicate and it's very healthy and they do pretty well. We legislate against that and we maintain this incredibly chronic def deficiency and it doesn't work very well except we're allowed to take Prozac of course or we're allowed to take these synthetic versions that are utter rubbish and have side effects but we're not allowed to reaccess some elements of this state of being that, that was entirely dependent on a very very rich cocktail of drugs. That's you know that's what plant chemicals are. The, the second point you wanted to elaborate on was uh, the symmetry uh, between the two brains. Uh, I think far as I'm reading this is perhaps the, uh, what connects the left and right. Is there an actual physical connection? Uh, what's that connection called? Um, is that connection broken? So on and so forth. Right, I think probably the point I was making, I mean, there is a physical connection. I, I, I just wanted to be absolutely clear that, that this whole take isn't about the left side of the brain being bad or evil and the right side being all functional. I'm saying they were both, in, in this ancient epoch, in this symbiotic association, they were both identical and phenomenally functional, identical function, both closer to what the right brain is now and some. So basically, Put it another way, the left brain is just a, just a degenerate version of what the right brain is, except they were both probably more functional again, and they worked as a single system. And I mean, there's still a, you know, the connections are still there, but there's such a mismatch now that the, the left side of the brain is so primitive, it's actually frightened of the right brain. It can't, doesn't have the neurological structure or capacity to comprehend or experience what the right hemisphere can. So it's a very frightening experience, so it shuts it out. But I. I I say that's essentially what I'm saying. It's not that it's not about demonizing the left hemisphere, even though I may sound like I do that at times. I'm just saying it's a badly broken version of the right hemisphere. When they were both working, they both had all of these traits and they could both what whatever we think the left hemisphere is specialized in now, and of course it's the left hemisphere thinking it's specialized in things, so you're in that loop again. When they were both working, or when we can still access the right hemisphere, it can do everything that the left hemisphere can do a hundred times better in radically different ways. It's not specialized adaptation, it's degeneration, but we're looking at it from the wrong side of the brain. So it's going, hey, aren't I cool because I can speak? I can't sing, which is actually way more advanced, and I have to get out of my head to sing, but never mind the detail, speech is really advanced. Well, that's a classic example of the left brain legitimizing its own highly dysfunctional abilities. Thank you. That's a really good example. I love that example. It's in the book, in fact, isn't it? I, yeah, I think yeah. it's mentioned, yeah. I, I kind of call speech a dumbed-down version of singing, which it is. Yeah. I've, I, I want to speak about spindle cells, but I think I'll bring that in myself. Uh, if you're okay to speak about it, uh, I'd be, you know... I think it's probably something you might know more about than me. I mean, I'm aware of it. And yeah. I, 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 you know, just off camera, whatever, I, I'd be interested to know the correlation between developmental environments and hormones and how that affects cellular growth and whether there's a correlation just with the transcription. And yes, it might end up that that's a symptom, but is that actually the cause or is it just a symptom that some people, their neural cells develop less? I mean, one thing, 
you could mention from the book is Simon Baron Cohen's work, which again specifically talks about testosterone retarding the development of the left hemisphere. The neural cells are specifically affected by testosterone. Obviously, some people it's more, some people it's less, and that's mm -hmm. where you end up with the increasingly psychopathic male brain, um, yeah, which, yeah. you know, again, that's, that's hormones mean structural change. It might mean less spindle cells and hey-ho. Okay, all right. Um, I, do you want to say anything about Pandora's box, uh, the, the, the story of it? Because I, I, I hear it as this, that when the right brain gave us all that perception, all those superhuman senses, and I think this story tells it well, when it's all of a sudden this left-hand side <coughs> came awake, all of a sudden it knew fear, it knew hatred, uh, bitterness, and the way they describe it is that all these emotions suddenly flooded into the human brain, uh, feelings that she never knew before, and in her fear she shut the box, and within that box one remained to come out, which is hope, and hence human beings are walking around, sleepwalking as hopeless human beings. Mm. Uh, do you want to do anything with that? Well, I, I think it's a, a classic poetic or mythological description of exactly, you know, I think it's probably an accurate diagnosis, probably becomes, you know, the, all these traditions, I think, inevitably have become distorted by the condition itself. So as we retell the stories, the language changes and they become dogmatized and we miss the context and so on. But it, I think they're all effectively accurate diagnosis of what was going on. And I'd say particularly with that, I, I mean, I'd say it's less about, you know, the, the left side of the brain coming awake and being frightened, again, I'd say it's, it, it just was degenerating and structure correlates quite well with our sense of self. Well, if you have a uniform structure, you have a uniform self, very simplistically. If you get a divergence in structure due to genetic asymmetry, you end up with two selves and one's degenerating more quickly than the other. And it just happens that the left side self it, it, it reaches a, a distinct sense of self and it's a much more limited sense of self and it's frightened. Why wouldn't it be? It's like, you know, if we start losing our senses, if we lose our eyesight, lose our hearing, it's a frightening experience. Well, if, if one side of our consciousness equipment is losing sensory uh, input or losing sensory awareness, the world becomes a more frightening place. And humans, one of our defining traits is our fear. We're much more frightened than most of us ever care to admit. You know, we, we sit in the room here, we all know the rules, we all say the right things. Most of us could quite easily find a lot of fear if we didn't all follow the conditioned rules we've grown up with. And I certainly include myself in that. And that's endemic and that's part of what drives us. Anything to keep the fear just out of reach and we don't want to talk about it with anybody else. What on earth is that about? Well, fear is a symptom of mental ill health. And yet we know there are states of mind, certainly they're reported consistently enough, and some of us have glimpsed them, where the fear goes away. And it's, it's not delusion, you really don't feel frightened. It doesn't mean that you can't act, or that you can't perceive that certain things might have certain effects, but that nagging fear just dissipates. And that's fascinating to me. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there's some fascinating research still going on in Cambridge. Uh, Simon Baron Cohen, who's building on research, it goes back to at least the 70s, and uh, you know, remembering all the contexts we've been talking about. And he's particularly interested in autism, and to some degree autistic savants. And he's been looking at developmental environments, what goes on in the uterus. And he's he's put together ever more data. It's becoming quite conclusive that the the levels and activity, particularly of testosterone in the uterus, are very significant in how they affect neural development. And ba to cut to the chase, it looks like testosterone particularly affects the left hemisphere, more so than the right, and it inhibits or retards the development of the left hemisphere, particularly the neural cells. Now that's fascinating, that's considered currently just the way it is. And he's saying there's a good correlation with the degree of testosterone activity, or levels, and how autistic the male brain becomes. So there's like a spectrum, um, more testosterone, more autistic. Now, if he was to go along the corridor to anthropology and pharmacology and primatology, his colleagues would tell him that we were flooded 
as I've said, with chemicals that inhibit the activity of testosterone and some of the pathways that have this effect. So in an evolutionary context, if, if the evolutionary data is correct, we've become much more autistic in the classic male brain sense than we were. And those traits don't seem to be serving us at all well. You know, it's again losing that empathy, losing the compassion, losing the ability to see context, becoming more deluded. And that's just simply lack of communication. We're looking at it in isolation. We got this data, there's no context. Put the context back, we shouldn't be this affected by testosterone. That this, okay. this slow loss of this um, symbiotic formula has left us, again, left us exposed to our own primitive hormones. And the emergence of patriarchal culture um, and hierarchical structure, I'd say, are symptoms of this neurological condition. They weren't a different way of being in an advanced way. They're actually symptoms of degeneration in a, in a very clear neurological way. So we end up with this echelon of increasing dysfunction, not increasing function. Thank you. Figs. Can you speak a little bit about figs? Figs. Um, what do I want to say about figs? Nice. Well, it has <laughs> a lot of the stuff that you're talking about. Yeah, figs. Uh, All I, year I, round. I, 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 I mentioned figs partly because they crop up in traditions as being a sacred tree, a sacred plant, but also they are a primate favourite. I mean, if you, if you put ripe figs out, or ripe figs are in the forest, most primates will drop everything and just stuff themselves full of figs. That's all they want to eat. And figs are interesting because they are particularly rich in a whole bunch of chemistry and hormones and so on. Their seeds mostly are edible and they're quite rich in a really nice balance of essential fatty acids. Um, and I, I was just intrigued by the idea that figs may have been one of the key components of this symbiotic relationship because they grow in the non-seasonal tropics, they come into fruit at all different kinds of years, so they're, they're, they're much more available than some other fruits and so on. So it's really just highlighting figs as an example and there's been enough pharmacological studies on figs where you can begin to see the spectrum of neurochemistry that's in there, some of these monoamine oxidase inhibitors and the antioxidants and the essential fatty acids, perfect to build a very, a very complex neural system and lo and behold figs feature highly in primate diets wherever they're available. So it's really just highlighting a particular fruit that most people have heard of, I mean there are a lot more fruits that grow in the African forest we don't even know because they haven't been commercially exploited, rich in all sorts of things. But figs are a really good place to start if you want to look at the biochemistry of symbiosis. Thank you very much. Tony, the, the first question I'd like to put to you, it's to do with the high fructose diet that one would have had in the symbiotic environment. Mm. Why would that not have led to what today we would believe would be um, diabetes as a result of having too much sugar in our diet? Why would, in those days, under that situation, that not have occurred? Well, it, there's at least a couple of things. Uh, it, it's partly, I think, that um, the, the diet that we would have eaten, um, it, obviously very fibre rich, it would have been a very slow release in the classic sense, we wouldn't have been eating refined sugars and overloading with sugars and of course our physiology would have been embedded in that. I mean, we're, to be clear, we're not the species or animal we once were. There's been what I would suggest these pretty significant transcriptional epigenetic adaptive changes. So low, I'm not suggesting we can all go out now and eat 100% fruit because for most people that might cause problems, at least initially and even over time. Some people can get away with it. Um, I think the second part of that and looking at things like fructose intolerance and so on, um, again, that's back to transcription and it looks like a lot of the pathways and enzymes and mechanisms to deal with that are very plastic in their response to back to transcription environment. Well, if, if we've not been in that environment during our early development or even as we get older or we don't allow some of those mechanisms which are quite plastic they will partly switch on again um, they're just not going to work so we can end up eating what is effectively a highly specialized diet with a system that isn't highly specialized anymore so it's not surprising that we can end up with problems but i think some of them are just basic common sense you know if you don't eat modern hybridized fruit in huge quantities when you're not used to it or you, again you're going to run into trouble mm -hmm. But I think most of the diabetes problems is much more to do with refined 
sugars and um, or you know even naturally extracted it's still far too refined there should be a lot of fiber there to slow it down um, and then again I think that the, the complex chemistry in some of these fruits actually affects the transcription of the gut and the enzyme pathways and all sorts of stuff well that's missing and it was certainly missing during early development and some of those changes can be significant or even lifelong so although I think there's a way back to this this is part of my interest it will be a bootstrapping effect. It, it'll be trying to bring online some of the highly specialized assimilation um, systems that we once had that we don't have anymore before we can then actually start putting the rocket fuel in. It's, you know, it'd be like putting a rocket fuel in a clapped out old car. You might get more performance out of it. You're equally likely to blow the thing up, you know, but it doesn't mean that you can't carefully rebuild it and start putting the systems back in that can handle this specialized diet. Um, which is, I think, what a neural system needs. But we, you just can't go from dead stop to flying high again without a lot of risk. So I'm really interested in looking at how we can take step, steps back towards it. And for sure, you know, we're in a state now where we just can't do that for the most part. Do you, um, do you think it's possible in the space of uh, the evolution of our lifetime that it's we are capable of changing our structures sufficiently if you, we do, as you suggest, and gently reintroduce the appropriate elements into our diet until we move right over to a fully, um, fully fruit diet? Within a lifetime, I think there's quite a few variables. The key one being degree of cerebral dominance. That interests me a lot. But again, there are a lot of techniques that can start shifting that. And of course, it then ties in with the highly specific neurochemistry the right brain needs to run on. So it is a back to this bootstrapping effect. And I think you're right, it's depending on where you're starting from, your particular neuro, neurochemical regime and so on, there's, there's lots of steps you can take, but they will be slightly different for everybody, but moving in the same direction. And I certainly think it's possible to slowly improve diet and at the same time begin shifting your state of mind to these more efficient systems and it will take time of course and of course the more efficient the system becomes the more you can then bring in slightly more specialized diet and so on so yes I think you can do an awful lot in a lifetime however um, missing out on that highly unique early developmental environment that's very tricky because some of those windows more or less close you know they open and close and very difficult to go back and do much with them at least in our current understanding whether an incredibly rich, hormonally rich diet, you know, hormones are very powerful. They will change things real time. Whether the scope for that kind of therapy, I just don't know. But I certainly think if you start young enough and you're lucky enough to have a decent physiology, you can make massive inroads um, as long as it's combined with trying to move towards that more efficient and, and quite specialized system, which I think is still latent in us. But currently, that's not what's running the show. So again, it's a bit like putting highly specialized fuel in a bog standard car. Well, actually, you need to start transforming the mechanisms to, to utilize the fuel. Paradoxically, you need the fuel. You know, it, again, it's bootstrapping. I think, I think a lot can be done. And certainly within a generation or two, masses could be done. Um, but I'm certainly not saying, yeah, we just drop everything and eat fruit even though some people are exper experimenting with that and some people are getting some fascinating results. I, I personally think that's too simplistic. I'd like to be proved wrong, but I'd rather say, well, let's take a more cautionary approach. After 200,000 years, uh, it would be ludicrous to suggest, yeah, it's just enough to, to, to re-engage with this relationship when it was so integral to our development and physiology. Clearly, it must have changed, so we're going to have to take these steps, appropriate steps, moving back towards that and I don't think it would take you know even more pessimistically because it's developmental massive changes can be made over two or three generations uh, you know in principle we could do a lot in one generation if it's done carefully um, I mean there's a paradox in all of this uh, and certainly other people have had similar experiences if if it turns out that what I've put together which is really just drawing on other people's data and ancient traditions if it looks like it makes sense certainly in terms of my abilities to do to see context were non-existent before I started experimenting with diet and again there was a bootstrapping effect the better I ate the more I was able to get into more functional altered states and the more I could see this picture now it's a bit circular at the minute because maybe it'll turn out to be a bunch of nonsense but on the other hand if it turns out to be accurate that only came 
out of altering my state, you know, changing the equipment I was using to look at the problem. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how things evolve because I can then say, well, you know, I'm not such a sharp guy. It was changing the structure which affects the ability to see these things. Have you done any research on the diet of advanced spiritual teachers, yogis, <coughs> lamas? A, a little bit, and I, there's two things. Firstly, I, I'd say, I mean, again, I, I'm, you know, I love to do context first. In this case, I think it's useful that I, I'd say all the traditions, the, you know, the Arcadian mythology, the spiritual tradition, even when they distill into religious concepts and they're quite dogmatized, they all have the same story. And the practices, not the concepts, the practices and techniques, if you strip away the dogma, you can put it in modern neurological terminology. And really, there, there were a bunch of techniques to inhibit the left hemisphere, a bunch of techniques to stimulate the right hemisphere, and an engineering rebuild, which makes sense. That was part of it. So they often talk about natural diet, simple foods, fruits often talked about. So they were putting all these things together. Uh, and I think there was a lot more awareness that all these elements were important, particularly in combination. You get much more powerful effect if you simultaneously engage these things or engage them in sequence. Um, however, I think we're in such an impoverished state, more so than we can realize. You know, our state of mind is, is, is contracted a lot, but that's our normal reference point. And because it's a universal condition, our reference points aren't that different, except people who have these phenomenally different experiences, which is interesting. But I, I think it's possible with techniques, or if you're born with a particular brain configuration, it can even be a bit more damage to the left hemisphere, but that can give you access, as, as in Savant syndrome, where people can have relatively profound access um, without necessarily adopting much dietary change, because the even, even limited access to the right hemisphere is so profoundly different that I think it's easy to mistake that as full function again. Well, I think they're just relatively small glimpses. It's really a measure of how dysfunctional a normal state of mind is. So I, I think certainly it's possible to get these relatively big jumps without putting all the bits back together. But of course, it's not so difficult to figure out, well, if you put all these bits together, particularly with these sensitive people who maybe have a bit of a head start over most of us, if they put the nutrition back, if they did it, God knows, you know, it would be pretty impressive. But people can get quite attached, you know. People who are interested in psychedelics think, well, all you need are psychedelics. Or people who are into diet, oh, well, you just need diet, which of course is loaded with drugs, and psychedelics are bad, and so on and so on and so on. You start putting them all together carefully, the effects are massively more than any individual. Um, but not very many people are practicing that anymore. It's got lost, you know. So, uh, yeah, I, th I think it's possible to access relatively powerful states without any recourse to diet. But I think it's a limiting factor as well. Have you any suggestion or have you thought about why there appears to be such a very large increase in the rate of autism that's diagnosed globally these days? Yeah, obviously it's a fascinating area. Um, there's a lot of variables and part of it might just be awareness, but I would expect in a very general way that that trend for increasing asymmetry in, because of this degenerative transcription environment and build quality has gone down the pan terribly in the last 50 years. You know, we talked about junk food, so we, we, we've, we've lost the transcription environment, virtually gone, so we've lost all the design, we've, we've lost the unique construction materials, we're incredibly impoverished in our neurochemistry, which then affects all the hormones and so on. So I'd expect that asymmetry to be enhanced as, as this condition progresses and we would be getting, um, we would be coming as a species more autistic effectively and that has that's a double-edged sword to that, more dysfunctional in some ways, paradoxically in some individuals that getting to such an extreme it starts to break down and then glimpses of something other and I think that's what's going on, it's a paradox almost but it's particularly in men. I think men, because testosterone is such a key element in this, I mean, it's not uniquely male or female, but I think men exhibit that more. There is, you know, a great many more cases of male autism than female, and it's been increasingly diagnosed. But again, back to basics, you cannot possibly build such a complex system, throw away the design, throw away the construction specifications, throw away the neurochemical specifications, and expect it to work. It's ludicrous. And we know 
they, those things are all heading in a particular direction, I'd say horrendous direction, why would we expect it to not, you know, why would we expect it to be stable? Of course it's going to get worse. And things are getting worse. We, whatever we kid ourselves, things are getting worse. Are you aware that um, oxytocin is now being prescribed for people who, with um, autism? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it, it's a powerful hormone, and it was mentioned before, and again, I, I use that as an example. You know, if one hormone can have such a significant effect, what about this massive complex that went missing? You know, if, if we can get this effect with this hormone, or a glimpse with MDMA, or whatever, what happens when we put 10,000 chemicals back that we know were there based on the orthodox evidence? Mm. You know, do, do we want to run with a neural system that we're building it from rubbish and it's built from non-biological materials? We know all this. Or do we want to start putting back, you know, the 95% plus antioxidants, the 95%? It's our choice. We can choose the configuration. We can choose the regime we're running. And currently we're choosing a regime that, that manifests as insanity and war. But we could change that. And we know if we change it, like the oxytocin example, tiny changes massive impact. I mean, a tiny amount of oxytocin makes a massive impact. Exactly. Well, that's part of my excitement with this. There's so much focus on behavioral change and conceptual change. Bring it back to the structure. And, you know, I'm not saying we are a structure, but it's, again, it's back to like the violin and our sense of self is the music, or it's back to the telescope and the light images who we really are. But minute changes in, in the diameter or the grinding of the lens massive impact. So why aren't we looking at the structure? And it's not because we don't know, because we have laws to stop us messing around with the structure, and yet we're being screamed at to change our behavior. Well, one thing that changes behavior is structure, and we have a structure that we know has got nothing to do with biological evolution. Oh my God, what the hell are we doing? Let's change the structure. It's dangerous to maintain this structure. If we do nothing, we know we're screwed. You know, if we start changing the structure judiciously and carefully in the direction we know can be helpful, you can have massive impact overnight. Again, from these studies that have been done, and again, I cite MDMA again, not as a solution, just as an example. Very aggressive people, next thing they're loved up and hugging each other. I mean, that's, that to me shows the potential of changing the structure. Can I just ask you, what is MDMA? I'm not familiar with it. Ecstasy, it's, it's obviously, uh, oh. you know, it's... it's, it's uh, well, I'd say it's a lot less powerful in many ways. In some ways, it's quite shallow, but it does br it can bring about a very empathic and loved up feeling. And considering the world we live in, yeah, yeah. you know, I'd quite happily deal with the consequences of that than people in their current state, you know, psychopathic without any empathy. With it, you know, it, it might be that, that that there might be problems, but I'd rather deal with those problems. Yeah, yeah than the problems we currently have. Yeah. And again, I'm, I, you know, I cite this not as, I'm not saying that's what we should be doing, I'm just saying that's an example of tiny change like oxytocin, massive impact. And there's lots and lots of data. We know there's lots of things we can put back in our neural configuration and the effects are beneficial. Why aren't we doing that? Well, because we're f insane. Yeah. No, I think it has to do with the large corporations running the main show, isn't it? But, but is that not a symptom of insanity, that, that those people would, would aspire for control and do that? Would it, why would anybody do that if they were sane? Well, they're not sane, obviously. Well, there you go. So, so we have the more, the more insane people are running the show, as yes. you'd expect. But I think we can, we can step back and we can make decisions individually for ourselves and say we're stepping back from the insanity and we're taking responsibility and we're just putting things into our body that we feel is going to be conducive to yep. us feeling well mentally, physically, emotionally in every, way, in, in every sense. Yep. And that, that is possible for every person, regardless of social um, background to do to a, to a degree I think it is yes we can all certainly aspire to do that I think it can be challenging in some of the some of the cultures so-called civilization we live in where there's a lot of restriction on that kind of freedom of choice I mean there's a lot of cultures where playing music or dancing is frowned on or even prohibited or altering your state of consciousness is prohibited you know maintaining this status quo of insanity is part of the sickness because the rational mind's terrified of change. Familiarity is everything, even if it's nuclear power stations and war. At least it knows what that is and it wants more of it. So I, I agree with you, but I also think there are some um, social problems, structural problems in society to overcome as well. And, you know, that's where I'm interested. If this can be framed as a neurological condition, 
something we all know anyway, where a, a percentage of people are clearly more insane than other people, and I'm not judging them by my standards, just generally, if it can be framed neurologically and there's good rational evidence that even the left brain can understand, so it's not philosophy, it's not people just having around, it's like, well, here's the neurology, here's the data, I think it makes it a lot more uncomfortable then for people who have those very powerful desires to be in control, but they're less functional. It's, it's a lot more uncomfortable for those kind of people to want to take control when it's universally known that that's a symptom of insanity. Whereas at the minute, it's just a lifestyle choice or there's a lot of people will justify Darwinian competition. Well, this is what we're supposed to do, compete and fight. If it can be reframed as no, that's degenerate and primitive in a very rational way, very reductionist way. I mean, part of my interest is trying to sell the diagnosis, which is a very ancient diagnosis. There's nothing new in this. I, I think the problem is getting ahead of the dysfunction and framing it in a language even the dysfunctional, the most dysfunctional minds can understand and feel uncomfortable about, feel that there's a need to act. Because people have known forever this that's insanity, but trying to say it in poetic language or spiritual language, it's a waste of time if you can't reach the most dysfunctional people because they're the ones that usually... But they're the ones who are making the decision. They're the insane ones. Exactly. Well, so, so it's finding a language that will make some impact at that yeah. level.